Hi, and welcome to the fourth edition of What Hams Do, the TV show. I'm your host, Jay Silver, and I'm the Public Information Coordinator for the Eastern Pennsylvania section of the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. Now, before we go any further, listen to this. That's the sound of a government radio station called WWV. It's from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and it transmits an absolutely accurate time signal on several shortwave radio frequencies. We'll get into why that's important later in tonight's show, as we talk about how hundreds of amateur radio operators all across America are now citizen scientists, joining professional scientists studying the weather in outer space. So here's the lineup for tonight's show. First, we'll look at the news affecting amateur radio here in eastern Pennsylvania and elsewhere. We'll have an update on the distracted driving legislation in Pennsylvania that could impact the use of ham radio mobile operations. The rest of our show is devoted to amateur radio operators jumping right into the science of the ionosphere. We'll explore the projects of hamside.org and their powerful impact on our understanding of how the sun impacts communications. We'll talk to the people who run hamside.org and its current project, and hams who are participating, including yours truly. <laughs> we'll move over to the newsroom in just a moment, after this message from the ARRL. Hi everybody, this is Joe Walsh. One thing I do when I'm not playing rock and roll is get on the air as an amateur radio operator. Also called ham radio is a communication service provided by ordinary people just like you and me. We have a national emergency communication system in place 24-7, 365. We provide local and regional assistance when any part of the grid goes down. We help fire and police, families, hospitals, schools, handicapped, injured, at community events, sports, races, parades, gatherings, and celebrations. We provide free communications to help people and keep them safe. Find out more about amateur radio at ARRL.org slash what is ham radio. See you on the air. We can report some progress in gaining an exemption for amateur radio operators in the newly introduced distracted driving bill in the Pennsylvania legislature. Representative Rosemary Brown reintroduced House Bill 37, and it has an amateur radio exemption, but the wording currently only exempts handheld devices like our HTs. We think this might have been an oversight, so we have suggested adding the word mobile to the exemption text. We'll keep you informed of our progress or whether or not amateur radio operators in Pennsylvania should contact their local state reps and ask for an amendment to the bill. Stay tuned. The Red Cross of southeastern Pennsylvania covering the five-county Philadelphia region is building a cadre of amateur radio operators with the intention of setting up an amateur radio operation at the Red Cross facility at 23rd and Chestnut Streets in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia Amateur Radio Emergency Service is urging all its members to join the Red Cross as amateur radio volunteers so the two organizations can work together in disaster relief services. We're joined now by our co-anchor Frankie Bonte, continuing in her second semester at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Frankie, what do you have for us this evening? Tonight, Jay, we were able to report that this year's QSO Today Virtual Ham Radio Expo will take place on March 13th and 14th. The ARRL is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. The fee to attend this year is $10. Last year, 16,000 people participated, and this year, the online expo will include kit building workshops great presentations, and it features easy to use video technology to meet up with presenters and exhibitors. It was my pleasure last year to make a presentation in the Ham Expo Youth Forum based on my work studying the Earth's magnetosphere. A link to the Ham Expo webpage where you can sign up is in the description below this video. 
And while we're talking about conventions, we are also pleased to report that the ARRL is planning its first big post pandemic convention in Orlando, Florida, now set for February 10th to the 13th in 2022. The 2021 convention was postponed till next year based on advice from the national public health experts. The focus of the 2022 hamcation, as it's called, will be rediscover radio. Here's a portion of the video the ARRL released about the 2022 convention. Hello, I'm Rick Roderick, K5UR, and I want to invite you to get to Orlando, Florida next February for the 2022 ARRL National Convention. The convention will be hosted by our friends from Orlando Hamcation. Hamcation has hundreds of volunteers who are already working hard to welcome our worldwide community of ham radio friends to Florida, and I can't wait to see you there. The theme of the, our 2022 National Convention is Rediscover Radio. The theme is a rallying call for all AWRL members committed to developing knowledge and skills in radio technology and radio communication. When I see you in Florida, I want you to tell me all of the ways you've rediscovered radio. Some of you have heard me say for a number of years that amateur radio is the greatest hobby in the world. We've got so much to celebrate together. So get to Orlando in February 2022. See you there in 73. Now, I was going to report on the upcoming hamside.org workshop set for March 19th and 20th, but I understand you'll have details about that later in tonight's show. Is that right? That is correct, Frankie. In fact, tonight's show is about how hamside.org is recruiting amateur radio operators to become citizen scientists. And you're one of them, right? I am. And that's what really got me involved in amateur radio. I'll tell you what, you stick around a few minutes and we'll talk about amateur radio operators as citizen scientists. Would that be okay? Absolutely. All right, we'll see you in a few minutes. We can also report that the Holmesburg Amateur Radio Club in Philadelphia is now also on Mars. That's right, Mars. Among the 11 million names etched electronically into a chip carried aboard the Perseverance rover that landed on February 18th on the surface of Mars is the call sign of the Holmesburg Club, WM3PEN. Congratulations to the Holmesburg Club for getting itself planted firmly on the red planet. And that's the news for now. We'll go back to the studio and continue our discussion of amateur radio operators as citizen scientists right after this message from the ARRL. She's collected stories from the Australian outback. Good day, mate. Shared jokes in Israel. Little man walks in the doctor and says, Doctor, I have a ring. Recipes with Parisians. Gets firsthand hurricane <laughs> reports from the Caribbean. They are in the process of evacuating. The Weather reports from the sun. And traffic reports from any place she wants to go. She's a radio ham. Learn how at helloradio.org. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. So we talked earlier about the sounds coming from WWV, the government's time reporting station. WWV is always there, always transmitting, and always on the same four shortwave frequencies. And just below it is a constant forever tone. And we can listen to that tone for changes caused by what's happening in regions of space above planet Earth. Scientists refer to it as space weather. And that's what the personal space weather station, operated by hundreds of amateur radio citizen scientists, will do from today right on up to a very special event in April of 2024. There will be an eclipse coming up in April 2024, and we want to have these devices um, ready to go so that we can deploy them across the United States again to try and get uh, to try and get measurements of this upcoming eclipse. That's Dr. Nathaniel Frizzell, the guy who started hamside.org back in 2017 when there was another eclipse event. He's a pretty interesting guy. So uh, my name is Nathaniel Frizzell. I'm an assistant professor of physics and engineering at the University of Scranton. So in addition to hamside.org, I teach uh, physics classes. I teach electrical engineering classes. 
I do some community service and you service the university. I work on scientific research. I mentor students. I wear many different hats. So, Nathaniel, tell us how hamsci.org got started. Uh, so, hamsci.org is a collective that I started about four or five years ago now. And its mission is to join together the professional space science research community and the amateur radio community so that both communities can help each other out. Why the amateur radio community? Well, that's actually how I got started. So I now have a PhD in electrical engineering and ionospheric physics, but I got that interest because I was a ham radio operator first. So I started in ham radio when I was in high school. Um, actually, my interest even started before that, but I actually got licensed in high school and I eventually went to graduate school to study uh, ionospheric physics. And while I was in grad school, I saw that there were all of these physicists who knew all sorts of things about the ionosphere out there, but not all of them or many of them were hams. And they didn't really know about the amateur radio community and what they might be able to provide. And vice versa, many of the ham radio operators use the ionosphere every day, but they didn't really know what goes into the professional side of things. And so I thought by putting together something like this, the two groups might be able to come together, find some common ground and help each other out. The personal space weather station now being distributed to hams across the country consists of a Raspberry Pi computer and a special GPS receiver. The Raspberry Pi has perfect pitch. <laughs> what I mean by that is this GPS device creates an absolutely perfect tone of a thousand hertz or a thousand cycles per second. And the Raspberry Pi compares that perfect tone to WWV's 1000 hertz tone to see if it goes up or down in pitch based on solar activity. So a little science here. The ionosphere is an atmospheric layer, actually a couple of layers, ranging from 30 miles to 600 miles above the Earth. A couple of things happen when the sun warms the ionosphere. First, it goes up in altitude. And when the sun goes down, the ionosphere drops in altitude. A radio wave like WWV's radio signal bouncing off the ionosphere when it's going down, coming closer to us, is like an airplane sound as it approaches us. The pitch of the sound increases. And then as the ionosphere rises when the sun hits it, it moves up or away from us, and signals bouncing off it decrease in pitch, just like an airplane moving away from us. And that's called the Doppler effect, or Doppler shift in frequency. But wait, there's more. More that happens when the sun hits the ionosphere. So there certainly is heating and cooling of the atmosphere and the ionosphere. That's absolutely true. Uh, but one of the predominant processes is something we called ionospheric production uh, and photoionization and recombination. So when the solar ultraviolet light hits the upper atmosphere, you can actually, that energy can actually strip electrons off of neutral molecules. And that will create uh, positive ions and free floating electrons. And that's what creates the ionosphere. That's the ionization process. When the sun goes away, the free floating electrons can recombine with the positive ions, creating neutral particles. And that causes the ionospheric electron densities to decrease. And it returns back to a, a more neutral atmosphere. And so that's called recombination. Radio waves bounce off the ionosphere. That's what makes worldwide radio communications possible. So a radio wave is a sine wave. Remember that from high school math and physics? The radio frequency is the number of sine waves per second coming off a radio transmitter's antenna. We used to call these cycles per second, and now we simply call them hertz, after the scientist who discovered electromagnetic waves. The length of each of these sine waves varies with the number of sine waves per second. So with the frequency of 14 million sine waves per second, or 14 megahertz, each sine wave is 
20 meters long. And the ham radio 20 meter band is where a lot of worldwide contacts are made. In the last year on 20 meters, I spoke to a guy in Indonesia, then someone in Beirut, Lebanon, and lots of folks all over Europe. And that's because my signal bounced off the ionosphere and reached them. But signals of different wavelengths behave differently in the ionosphere. A two meter signal may bounce back, but it misses the Earth entirely on the way back. An 80 meter signal may bounce back and depending on the time of day, that is, depending on what the sun's doing, that bounce could be very short, just a couple of hundred miles, or very long, a couple of thousand miles. So while we can predict these bounces during normal sunrise and sunset hours, things get really crazy when there are sunspots and solar flares. And the personal space weather station can record all of that. Here's John Gibbons of Case Western Reserve University, an engineer who designed the personal space weather station. John calls the Raspberry Pi and GPS combination that he sent me the grape. You see, during the night, we have a very high signal, and then when that layer dissolves with the sunrise, you see the frequency shifts up because what's going on is the thing gets ionized. It's dropping the layer so the distance is getting shorter so we get a Doppler shift up. And subsequently at nighttime, when it goes the other way, we get a Doppler shift down because it's going up in distance. So you can see the, sh the Doppler shifts in frequency at 5 megahertz. That's an amazing now, explanation. Is there one more you wanted to show me? Yes, there's one more here, 10 megahertz. And this is what you programmed my, my system for. And right now during the day, you can see 10 megahertz is coming in nice and strong. So during the night, the signal level is way down. And then right at sunrise, we get a signal comes up and then the characteristic is you, this is usually pretty solid up here. And then at sunset, it goes away. And this is, but you'll notice there's a slight slant to this line that's unique to 10 megahertz. They all have that, and we don't know why. Whether it's a gradual change of the atmosphere as, it, as the sun is going across, or we don't know, but that's part of the science we're trying to figure out. But if we move ahead, this is the 13th, we're starting to see some right. effects of sunspots. This right here was mm -hmm. probably a solar flare. And then that's the 15th. The 16th, you can see it's getting really wild with all the sun activity and this going back to normal on the 17th. The 18th, it's getting there and then you get that slow slope there. And that's absolutely yesterday. fascinating. Thank you. And again, you can see the, the Doppler shift up in frequency as the atmosphere changes height and you get the Doppler shift down over here, rolling over as the ionosphere changes again going in the nighttime. But again, this is only a 0.75 hertz. That's a half hertz at 10 <laughs> megahertz. So it's not much of a change, but you're able to see it with this kind of equipment. John Gibbons is also a very interesting guy. I'll let him tell you a bit about himself. Okay, I am the uh, lab director for the Sears Undergraduate Electronic Design Lab at Case Western Reserve University. My job is to run the lab and help with all of the students in there to show them how to really do real electronics and all that good stuff. So in April of 2024, there is going to be a total eclipse that runs right smack through Cleveland, Ohio. Uh -huh. And that shadow that's going at a supersonic rate is going to pass over and it's going to change the characteristics of the ionosphere because it deletes the sunlight from ionizing the atmosphere. And we had done this before on the one that was previous uh, back in 2020, 2019, 2018. I remember, don't remember what it was. Um, and they thought that the time constant for how long it took to dissolve was like an hours, and they determined that it was actually in minutes. So we've actually learned quite a bit already, but being this one's going right over the top of where we're at, we're trying to set up two or 300 of these personal space weather stations to measure what's going on as this event happens. It was actually 2017, as Nathaniel Frisell mentioned. And at that time, they created a contest among the ham radio operators participating as citizen scientists. It was called a QSO party. A QSO, or QSO, 
is a radio connection or conversation between two amateur radio operators. Well, in, on August 21st, 2017, uh, there was a total solar eclipse that went clear across the United States from the northwest down to the southeast. It's known as the Great American Solar Eclipse, and there was lots of media about it. And what's interesting is the solar eclipse, that shadow cast by the moon, will actually cause an effect on the ionosphere, and therefore it will cause an effect on the radio communications that are supported by the ionosphere. So we wanted, I wanted to see if we could study that using the ham radio communications tools that were out there. So we had a, a big PR uh, project. Uh, we created the Solar Eclipse QSO Party to create one of these QSO Party contests that took place during, before, during, and after the Solar Eclipse. And so people during the Solar Eclipse, they made as many contacts as they could with each other. And these automated observation systems, one's called the Reverse Beacon Network, made note of all of these different contacts and then I was able to take that data and we were able to write up a scientific publication uh, looking at how the eclipse affected the communications and we were able to compare that with the scientific model and we were able to get that published. The published paper included graphics demonstrating the downward plunge in the number of QSOs when the sun was totally blocked by the moon on several amateur radio wavelengths and how long it took for the QSO level to return to normal after totality had passed. It was, as John Gibbons mentioned, a new finding. Nathaniel explained what happened on the 20 meter amateur radio band where signals are transmitted at a frequency of 14 megahertz. Before the eclipse happened, you can see that there were lots of 14 megahertz communications going on across the United States. Once you got to totality, you could see that the number of 14 megahertz communications decreased dramatically because the signals were being lost into space. And then when the sun comes back and photo ionization starts occurring again, then you see the 14 megahertz band recover and you see lots of communications again. I unboxed the personal space weather station that John sent me on camera with him. Here's what it all looks like and what it does. Two packages in the box. Right. Cardboard box basically has the accessories. It's got the two video cables, the power supply, and I believe that's it. Okay, right. So these are accessories. I've got the power supply. I've got uh, that looks there's like a micro a HDMI cable to an HDMI cable, and then there's an adapter cable. Gotcha. Okay, and there's and this, the uh, GPS antenna for the. Oh, oh, there's a GPS antenna here. Yes. Okay, got that. Yeah, now, that... Um, the, other, the other part of this must be the computer itself. Is that right? Yes. So I'm just going to take this out of here. And, and this little thing is a computer. Yeah, in the plastic box is a Raspberry Pi 4B with 4 gig of memory. A Raspberry Pi 4B with 4 gig of memory. 4 gig that of sounds... memory. That sounds like a lot for this little tiny thing. <laughs> it's actually got four cores that are running at 1.4 gigahertz each. It's a pretty powerful little computer, and it runs the Raspbian Linux OS. And I can, uh, at some, so there's some place here where I can plug a, a, a keyboard and a mouse into this and a monitor. Yeah, right? you, you would do that. Uh, the monitor would be, on the one side, there is a jack. There's a set of jacks. I see that over here, yeah. Yep. The very left side one is the USB-C, which is the power jack, which is what that power supply will plug into. Got it. I see that. Yep. And the first jack to the right of that is a micro HDMI cable, which will plug into your monitor. Oh, cool. Okay. Excellent. And then on the, if you go around 90 degrees on the side of the case, there'll be four USB connectors and an RJ45 for internet if you want to do wired internet. Uh, is it also Wi-Fi capable? Yes, it is Wi-Fi capable. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it does 2.4 and 5 gig. These data files that the graphic display represent will be sent over the internet to a team collecting the data for analysis. So my grape is now recording all that data and guess who else has a grape? Frankie Bonte, 
our news co-anchor. Frankie, this isn't your first hamside.org project. Tell us how being a citizen scientist has had an impact on your life. Well, citizen science is really how I got involved in ham radio. And being able to be a part of several hamsci.org projects in the past has allowed me to get involved in research even as a high schooler and be able to present it to scientists and ham radio operators about my findings. And don't go away. I want you to listen to Dr. Frisell. I asked him why amateur radio operators make good citizen scientists. Well, um, I think because of two reasons. The first reason is they're inherently interested. So they are people who have self-identified as being interested in technology and science. And so they've gone the extra mile to go ahead and train themselves and learn, learn about things. So that's number one. And then number two, I think they're good citizen scientists because they are now not just interested in, in this for whatever reason, but they're also using these things on a regular basis. So these amateur radio operators that get on the HF radio, they will be affected by space weather. They will be affected by the things that they're measuring. So their, their technical training and, their, um, and the fact that they are actually being affected by the things they're studying, I think that makes them very good citizen scientists. I would add one more thing. They have antenna. Oh, yeah. They have antennas. They do. Yes, they do have <laughs> antennas. That's quite important. What's your thought about Nathaniel's comments about amateur radio operators as citizen scientists? Well, citizen science has been in the news a lot more recently because of the need to collect large data sets. Yet citizen science has been around for a long time in many fields of study. Citizen science allows for this collaboration across all levels from people who study something for, to, for their full-time job to those who do it in their spare time or as a hobby. And it's been proven that the scientific advancements that result from this collaboration between citizens, scientists, and ham radio operators can make big waves of positive change. Thanks, Frankie. We'll see you on our next What Hams Do. Study hard and be safe. All right, thank you, Jay. If you're interested in getting involved in hamside.org, I recommend visiting their website to learn about projects like the Personal Space Weather Station. And you might want to sign up for their March 19th and 20th two-day workshop. A link to sign up for the workshop is in the description below this video. The workshop is free, and it fosters collaboration between the amateur radio community and the scientific space weather community. One final note. If you're interested in becoming a licensed amateur radio operator, you can study for your license exam at hamstudy.org. Exams are available online as well. And that's it for this edition of What Hams Do. To get notified when our next show will premiere, please click the red subscribe button on the EPA-ARRL YouTube channel. And then click the notification bell so you don't miss our future programs. And until our next show, this is Jay Silver, WA2UAR, saying 73. That's the way hams say goodbye. See you on the radio.